Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern Bar Cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome to episode 244 of the Modern Bar Cart Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Koslick. Thanks for joining me for another interview episode where we track down the best and brightest minds in the spirits and cocktail world so that we can share their secrets with you. This time around, I'm joined once again by Cecilia Tishy. She's a professor of American studies at Vanderbilt University and the author of books on Jazz Age cocktails and Gilded Age cocktails, which was the topic of our last conversation. But this time around, we're going to discuss the often neglected or at least highly stereotyped and caricatured era of American drinking culture that defined the middle of the 20th century. Many of us draw our mental representations of this time period from old black and white TV shows like Leave it to Beaver and The Andy Griffith Show, as well as perhaps more contemporary series like Mad Men and The Man in the High Castle. But Cecilia has spent her time immersed in the primary sources of this era, the newspaper headlines and tabloids the photographs, the maps of planned neighborhoods, the anatomical diagrams of the interstate arteries that served to vascularize our country following the Second World War. As such, this conversation covers everything from beat poets to Russian satellites. So, in preparation for all that we're about to discuss, I thought this might be a splendid time for you to make yourself a drink. This episode's featured cocktail is the Wine Spodiote. Referenced in Jack Kerouac's Beat Manifesto on the Road, this drink is a chimeric take on an upside-down Manhattan with references to the flamboyant French Pousse Café and the Depression-era tradition of Spody wine. To make it, you'll need one part, generally one and a half to two ounces, of bottom-shelf American whiskey, that's bourbon or rye, and two parts, i.e. three or four ounces of port wine, probably sourced from that same bottom shelf and probably of the ruby or tawny variety. That's it, just two ingredients. And like the ingredients, there are a couple ways you can assemble and consume the venerable wine spodioti. One would be, as I mentioned, in the style of a French pousse cafe, which is a layered drink that was the original inspiration for all those layered shots that got popular in the 80s. Essentially, a pousse cafe is where you stack spirits with different densities and proof points on top of one another so that they form stratified layers in the glass. In the case of the wine spodioti, what you would do if you were doing it pousse cafe style is you'd put one part port in the bottom of the glass, then you'd add one part whiskey, and you'd finish it off again with one part port. So in reality, not much of a pousse cafe at all. In fact, this is the laziest possible way to mix a drink. And I guess the assumption is that maybe your finger might be too dirty to give it a stir. So let's make sure that whiskey isn't all just floating on top of the port. The other way you can think about the wine spodioti is as a series of shots. This is the way that's described in Cecilia's book. First, you enjoy a serving of port then a shot of cheap whiskey, and then you chase the cheap whiskey with another serving of the sweet fortified wine. Although there's not much good info out there on the internet on this topic, it seems like Spody wine harkens back to a depression era tradition of infusing low quality wine with fruit and herbs, then continuing to fortify it with whatever moonshine style spirits you could get your hands on. Imagine, sort of a love child between vermouth, sangria, and moonshine. That's Spody. So, now that you're equipped with a drink that only a Depression-era farmer or a thirsty beatnik could love, let's turn our attention back to the interview. In this mid-century retrospective with American Studies professor and author Cecilia Tishy of Vanderbilt University, some of the topics we discuss include... The historical backdrop for the society and culture of the mid-20th century, that is, a nation simultaneously traumatized by decades of war and economic depression and invigorated 
by economic prosperity and technological revolution. What drinking trends accompanied life in the big city, as well as those that took hold in the emerging cookie-cutter suburbs and the more upscale exurbs where wealthy elites lived and vacationed? What the ballooning size of cocktail glasses, from three up to four and a half ounces, and certain published entertaining guides meant for casual gatherings, in particular, how much one would be expected to take down over the course of an evening. We also examined certain bibulous subcultures, like the aforementioned beat generation, commuters with access to bar cars on their train commute home from work, African Americans who relied on the famous Green Book when seeking entertainment and lodging on the road, and many other facets of mid-century life. Along the way, we cover the allure of an emerging tiki culture, the surprising influence of the Playboy bar book, whether or not Don Draper and the cast of Mad Men managed an accurate portrayal of this drink-soaked era, and much, much more. For me, there's a lot of reasons to be excited about the launch of this book. As a fan of great writing, of writing that's really grounded in fine details and that delights in the power of description, I can tell you that it's simply a lovely read. But as someone who enjoys more than occasionally the opportunity to zoom out and consider the larger tectonic trends that have brought us to where we stand today as a nation, as a culture, as individuals with families and histories still very much influenced by this time, I'm fascinated by the contradictions that Cecilia uncovers and places under the microscope for us to consider. One image I'd like you to pay attention to as you listen is the notion of a duplex of bounty and fear. A house divided but with a shared wall where depending on which side you inhabit, you can hear either your worst nightmares or your highest aspirations moving around just on the other side of that thin divider. There's a lot to think about in this one. And there were a few little audio fuzzies that we couldn't quite iron out in post-production, which is just a fact of life in the era of remote recording. So thank you in advance for bearing with those little minor audio blips. You can pre-order your copy of Mid-Century Cocktails, History, Lore, and Recipes from America's Atomic Age, wherever books are sold. It launches on November 1st, which gives you plenty of time if you've got a cocktail fan on your holiday gift list or if you simply want to drop some not-so-subtle hints to those folks who might be shopping for you. But in the meantime, please enjoy this fascinating interview with author and scholar Cecilia Tishy. Cecilia, welcome back to the podcast. Eric, delighted to be here. So... For those of us who may be new to the Modern Bar Cart podcast, uh, Cecilia and I spoke previously about uh, another one of the books that you've written about the Gilded Age. And uh, this time we're here discussing an entirely different era of drinks and American history and culture. Uh, but for those of us who weren't able to join for the first episode, could you just give us a, a general overview of who you are and what you do? You bet. I'm Cecilia Tishy, T as in Tom, I-C-H-I, and for a good long time, I have taught and researched at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, becoming interested first in the Gilded Age. Age. Who were the writers? There's Jack London and his memoir, autobi autobiography, John Barleycorn takes one right into the cocktail culture uh, of, of the late 1800s into the 1900s. And so who's at the top of the social scale? Mrs. Astor and her 400 socialites. Uh, and what were they drinking? And so I became interested and frankly, over cocktails with my literary agent. The Mrs. Astor book was already out, and my agent, Deirdre Mullane, and I decided that we hadn't done enough with cocktails in that book. Shouldn't there be 
a separate book on Gilded Age cocktails. Well, let's see about that. And Eric, you and I talked about that book, Gilded Age Cocktails. And then came, well, the Jazz Age, Prohibition. Mm -hmm. What were they drinking? <laughs> and one person said they drank everything. They went into the bathroom and drank Listerine. Mm. <laughs> and H.L. Munkin called, called those years the 13 awful years of Prohibition. And then came mid-century. Here we were. Post-World War II, armed forces home, civilian life, what's going on? It's the Eisenhower era. It's the 50s and into the early 60s, the mid-century years. And Eric, I will admit that the publisher and I had something of a debate over the title. Mm. Maybe it should be Atomic Cocktails. I said... I think that's a little scary and cartoonish. So Atomic is in the subtitle, and there's an atom buzzing uh, on the cover, but we decided mid-century worked best. And the drinking patterns that emerge in those post-war 1950s years were quite distinct, and I think, and, and my publisher agrees, worthy of a book. And I hope you agree too, because here we are to talk about it. Indeed. We will certainly get to some of the striking differences between uh, the drinking trends and, and, quite frankly, just general culture and zeitgeist of this mid century era, especially when compared without the connective tissue of the jazz age to our last interview with the Gilded Age cocktails. It's, it's almost like two different cultures altogether. Um, to give a little bit of background, since this show is now 240 plus episodes in, we've spoken quite a bit with other folks about the jazz age. This Prohibition era looms large. We've had to really dig in and break down the causes of prohibition, the trends that occurred during prohibition. We've had people on from brands where their grandparents and great grandparents were actually bootlegging during prohibition. So we've spent a good amount of time looking into that era. We've also spent a pretty good chunk of time examining that pre-prohibition, the golden age of cocktails, which your book, Gilded Age Cocktails, sort of precedes and then dives headlong into, as you described with the case study of John Barleycorn. And I got to be honest, we really haven't spent much time at all looking at the middle of the 20th century, partially because in the 60s and 70s, we experience kind of like at the very end, kind of trailing into the 70s and 80s, where your book does not delve into, we dis we experience what's called the cocktail dark ages, according to many authors, which set us up for our current cocktail renaissance. So I think what I'm most excited about for this conversation is that we are going to hopefully fill in some of the context in one of the most noteworthy gaps we have, which is what connects the sort of roaring 20s prohibition era with the cocktail dark ages and what are the larger forces at work in there so i i maybe i'll just ask you for a general overview of what typifies this mid-century culture in terms of things like technology and the social sphere and then we can get into some of the drinking trends that that you dive into sure so here came the United States of America, both triumphant from the war. Um, nobody bombed us, even though there were near misses. Uh, the United States triumphant, and the Allies, of course. But along with the triumph came the, came the nuclear threats. And so the phrase, and I quoted it in the book, wise up or blow up. So both the opportunity, the ebullience 
uh, here was peacetime manufacturing. Here came the suburban burgeoning um, Levittown. Suddenly, 10,000 houses that veterans, to be sure, white veterans, could buy, could be homeowners under the GI Bill with something like a $75 deposit uh, and their front yards. And, and those houses were stuffed with appliances. The Westinghouse twins, uh, television black and white until 1962 when it became living color under RCA, but the TV showing, showing the, the, the magic of automatic clothes washers and clothes dryers and refrigerators that had ample freezer compartments, not just chugging out a tray or two of gridded, gridded ice cubes that strained and strained to reach 32 degrees and freeze. No, no. This was an era of amplification and bounty. Um, and here came, you know this, the interstate highway system starting in 56. Um, America persuaded to take to the road. Detroit synonymous with, with the automobile. Again, payments on time. So the Ford Fairlane station wagons uh, and Pretty soon, uh, the suburban commute to the city or to an office park, dad home for the weekends, recreation, um, a whole new world underlying the anxiety. We remember the movie, The Dr. Strangelove, dark comedy. We, we see in, in Jack Kerouac's On the Road when the boys cross over into Mexico and there's a few lines. The Mexicans don't know that there's a bomb that might destroy everything. So amidst the ebullience, the celebration, there's this underlying anxiety. So these two things, and, and let's admit too, that drinking patterns had, had class stratification. Joe Sixpack stayed. The bowling shirts, the industrial workers, the guys and gals doing a shift at the plant, um, the six pack and the opener at church key until the flip top. Once in a while, Highballs, maybe with Seagram seven, seven and seven, meaning seven up and Seagram seven whiskey. And that was once in a while. Um, the bowling league, bingo night, that's, that's the working, I hate to say working class, but those are the, those are the folks enjoying a middle class life that was unforeseeable during the Depression. Meantime, the white managerial class, corporate management, and the new Madison Avenue, the Mad Men, there it was again, um, a new level of, of drinking for sophistication, uh, for, for a kind of, of Playboy magazines, a guideline on what constituted the better life. Schweppes, quinine water, advertised as endowing the feeling of good taste. So your taste started to come into your status. What were you drinking? And did it correlate with your newfound affluence? What suburb did you live in? Perhaps not Levittown. Perhaps the 509 took you farther into Westchester or out onto Long Island, where it was leafier, where your lots and gardens were tended by someone else. You didn't crank out the, the mower, even an old gas-powered um, um, electric uh, lawnmower. 
the lawn service was done for you. Um, perhaps the missus drove to the station to meet the commuter in his gray flannel suit at the end of the corporate workday uh, and drove back home where a pitcher of martinis awaited uh, and the better, the better life in the better suburbs were yours because you had earned them, you were qualified to have them. Mm. So a lot of what you have just gone over it can be core sampled, I think, in the introduction to this book. And I, I really love books where you can get a real sense of the scope, the weft and the warp of the work in the introduction. One of the other aspects of the last few minutes of explanation that struck me is that it reminds me of the power of catalog. And I think as somebody who with a poetry background, catalog is a device that can be used in poetry to drive home a point indirectly. So there's a wonderful poet named uh, Christopher Smart, who is actually writing in Bedlam in a literal insane asylum. And he has this wonderful poem called To My Cat, Jeffrey. And it's just lines upon lines upon lines of praises for his cat, Jeffrey, who keeps the mice away and who pounces joyfully and who just, it, it's just this wonderful catalog. And this device in the poetic tradition has a long lineage that has certain peaks and certain what we might call like apex examples in American culture. Obviously Whitman would be one of those in Leaves of Grass, Song of Myself. Another would be Allen Ginsberg in his poem, Howl. And I know that you list Ginsberg in your book as part of the beat generation. And sort of the eerie thing that I was picking up on as you were identifying some of these very concrete examples in your catalogs. That's the beauty of a catalog. It's all concrete. You can't have a, like a list of ideas is useless, a lit, but a list of things that shows you something. And so, you know, some of, some of the, the things that I just want to put on the table here are the difference between plenty and excess, the difference between a suburb and as you call it, a word that I'd never encountered, uh, encountered exurb, Right, the suburbs are the Levittowns, mm -hmm. and the exurbs are the ones that are further out there in Westchester, as as you mentioned, or on Long Island, where you don't cut the, the yard because the yard is a little bit too big for you to handle. So you need to bring in extra help. Uh, what was the dimension of the Levittown lot? You 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 listed this dimension that was just I think it was sixty by a hundred. Uh, every single every single lot. Yeah. Uh, Levitt, of course, had during his, during his military service had imagined uh, had imagined an industrial system, and and that's what he put into motion. That the houses would the plum the teams of plumbers would be on schedule, the teams of carpenters on schedule, the electricians, the roofers. And they could just march along uh, almost like a stapling gun. Bam, bam, bam. Let's do bear in mind that Levitt, a Jew, was perfectly willing to exclude non-whites from his, from his suburbs, his suburban dream. Uh, and the government of the United States took no hand opposing that segregation, that new segregation. And I know, Eric, we will talk about, about the Green Book and how the African Americans called the Negroes at the time, how their social life evolved in the in having come back from the war, fought in the war, to find the same segregation, the same exclusion, so we, uh, I don't in any way mean 
uh, nor do you, uh, to, to idealize this world of bounty because not everyone was entitled to it. I think that's a really important point. And I, I think rather than spending, <laughs> rather than spending more time on the uh, sort of what, what I might call the TV land depiction of, of the 1950s, I think we will actually be spending the bulk of our time uh, addressing this troubling dichotomy. Uh, Cause that's sort of what I was referring to in with this, the differences between plenty and excess suburb and exurb and, and there, there's more to get into there. But I figured before we dive deeper, I wanted to ask, have you seen the show Mad Men? Have you seen any episodes of it? And knowing that we have this, you know, Don Draper as sort of the epitome of the madman of Madison Avenue, do you think that it does, based on your research, a good job of depicting the overall culture and specifically the drinking culture? Or do you think that it is highly stylized for our entertainment or is maybe there a more accurate third interpretation on your reading of I, it? I, I think that it needed its stylization for entertainment purposes. Um, this is the book, I have to say, I admit. Uh, I have joked, this book road rashed me through my own lifetime. Uh, road rash being the phrase from motorcyclists uh, who, you know, somehow drop the bike and are scraped along and skinned a bit or more than a bit. Uh, uh, from the beginning of Mad Men, the scene in which a physician examines a woman in the examining room with a burning cigarette in his mouth, that wouldn't have happened. The burning cigarette would have been in the office after the examination when the two discussed the case. Uh, and the scenes of drinking uh, are also a bit, shall we say, stylized, but there's a lot that does get to the, to the feelings of that era, the, the hopes and the fears, and the both coupled. Uh, and Draper, Draper was a good one uh, to, to trail us through, through those years. But I would say uh, that, that uh, a careful reading of the text the novels, the poems, the memoirs of that era uh, ground one a bit more than one was allowed to be as the television viewer on and on and on of Mad Men. Sure. And I think for better or for worse, it's, it's one of the few recent depictions of that era that had any mass penetration and you know, thinking back to another piece of cultural art that depicts an era, you know, an American pie, the speaker isn't watching the devil up on the stage. He's, he's watching a, 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 just a hell's angel, a biker. And so there, there's some, there's some drama depicted in some of these, these uh, pieces of art that I, I don't think make them less compelling, but I, I, I do think it's important to emphasize that Yes, like as, as much as we, when I say like mid-century cocktails, someone immediately jumps to Mad Men and thinks of actual scenes from the show, I think it's important to put sort of a, a governor on where our imagination can go and realize that these were real people who put their pants on, you know, one leg at a time like we did, and it wasn't all like that. So go, please go ahead. Well, I was just going to, to, to say, um, and, and you, I think you're quite so accurate uh, to say that the that into the deep 70s, 80s, it was the it was a dark age. Uh, I've been asked, and I'm going to circle back in just one one second, but just to say, I was asked, could you do another cocktail book? I said that period was white wine, fern bars, and cocaine. No, not cocktails. Sure, but circling back. I was able for this book to get hold of the Playboy bar book uh, written by Thomas Mario, who was Hugh Hefner's master bar guy. 
and he's full of, of suggestions for the young bachelors who might be flush with cash, but had no family heritage in clubs or liquor cabinets at home uh, that might have, have schooled them in how to mix a cocktail. So Thomas Mario is quite, quite specific about the drinks, the numbers of drinks, and to read his suggestions that a host ought to plan for, for two or three drinks before dinner in glasses, not of the old three ounces, but four and a half. Four and a half ounce glasses, three of those before dinner. Wine with dinner, all through dinner. After dinner drinks, another two or three. Again, in those four and a half ounce glasses. This was the era of the three martini businessmen's lunch. There was a level of heavy drinking during this period that I think Mad Men uh, is, is right to emphasize because the documents that, that verify exactly those ounces and those periods before, during, and after, it's a lot. Still, I, so that's fascinating. I'm, I'm, I'm definitely interested in doing a little bit of independent research on Thomas mm -hmm. Mario. When you say that, though, I imagine myself knowing in advance, as I'm sure these folks did, certainly the hosts did, if they were following this blueprint, that I'm about to engage in, we'll say, four to six drinks, bookending, dinner and wine. The only context in which I would feel comfortable doing that is if I were in a group of people where I was very comfortable and very felt very free to say what I wanted to say and felt very much a, a part of the in-group. And I think this, even what you just described brings me back to sort of this undercurrent of anxiety that this book gave me. And I don't, I don't mean to say that as I read through it, I was anxious, but as I read through it, and I considered the implications, I kept coming back to this, what we call the, might call like a revolving motor of anxiety and plenty. Uh, and like, you simply can't do what you just described if you're worried about saying the wrong thing, because there's way too much alcohol going on for you to do that in a context where you do not feel completely within your peer group. And I think the one thing that this book highlighted more than anything to me is how much anxiety there was to want to drink and drink this way in the first place. And also just how stratified things became. Um, I don't know if that makes any sense. Right. Total sense, total sense. I mean, to live, to live with this, in this sort of duplex of, of bounty and fear, uh, in my acknowledgments, very briefly, I referred to the duck and cover drills that I remember. Um, class, we're having a duck and cover drill. Did we think consciously what was going on? Not, not really. And yet there was, there was a kind of, and you know this from this era, uh, a pressing angst about about atomic weapons, the atom bomb. Uh, after all, the wartime footage of the destroyed cities all over Europe were still very much in mind. Uh, let me mention this, you know, a little side note. I was a kid in West Palm Beach, Florida. I loved going into the ocean with my mask and fins. And I came up with this, this wax-like substance. Uh, it wasn't a rock, um, but what was it? I took it onto the beach, and an older man said, oh, that is carbo-wax. It was used to make munitions. 
He said, during the war, we could stand on this beach and see a line of ships burning because they had been torpedoed by the Germans. Now, this is off the east coast of Florida. I don't know how many people had that memory. He's the only person who told me this. I had no reason to disbelieve him. He was not dramatizing. He was just saying, this is from one of those torpedoed ships. So World War II, let's say, gave us a hangover in this country. And the hangover elided with the nuclear era. What would the Russians do? Um, and after all, Russia put Sputnik into the sky. Russia sent Yuri Gagarin up into space before we could do that. Our rockets started to blow up when we started a, a space program. So the angst about the space race, the Soviet Union, uh, was, was hovering in the midst of, of all this plentifulness and the images of Dresden bombed out still somewhere in the American mind. So lots of drinking um, to, uh, to dull the pain, uh, to send us into a kind of nirvana of good feeling. It was happening. Well, and of course, if, if World War II represented a, a hangover for us and or the period after World War II, there's certainly two ways you can choose to treat a hangover. You can become suddenly very healthy or you can do the easier thing and resort to the hair of the dog. So it seems like we see where America opted in that uh, two roads diverged moment. Mm -hmm. This episode is brought to you by Near Country Provisions. Yep, you've heard me singing their praises for the past year now, and to answer a question I'm frequently asked, yes, I still do a little happy dance when my monthly subscription shows up at my door on dry ice and in an insulated bag. I want to highlight a couple aspects of Near Country that normally take the backseat to their meat quality and their impeccable local sourcing, those being affordability and customization. I don't know if you've been paying attention to the price of groceries lately, but the cost of meat, even the factory farm stuff, has been skyrocketing. But because Near Country keeps things local to the Mid-Atlantic, your meat doesn't have to travel far, and it doesn't change hands half a dozen times before it hits shelves, meaning you don't have to pay for all those markups from middlemen. Every time I do a price comparison between Near Country and the grocery store, I'm blown away by the quality that I'm getting relative to the cost. And when it comes to flexibility, I've never worked with a subscription service where I have so much control. Let's say, for example, that you've got something against pork chops. Every month, Adam and his team send around a survey that allows you to say, hey, I don't want pork chops this month. Or, I don't want pork chops ever again. Or, a more reasonable request, I'd love it if you could include pork chops in my delivery every month. Preferences change, diets change, and special requests and cuts are always on your mind at certain times of the year, and Near Country gets that. They bend over backwards to help meet your changing needs. Head over to nearcountry.com and enter the code BARCART, all one word, that's B-A-R-C-A-R-T, when you sign up for your subscription to receive two free pounds of bacon or ground beef in your first delivery. And believe me, you'll be glad that you did. Now back to the show. But before we get into some of the crucial topic matter like the Green Book, as you mentioned earlier, I wanted to sit a moment with some of the more specific drinking trends. You mentioned the church key and then the eventual advent of, you know, the pull tab cans earlier on. I, I wonder if I can give you the distinction of 
we have two what we might call magisteria of drinking. There's drinking in the home and then there's drinking out, whether that out is at a bar or a restaurant or whether that out as you cover in your book is in the the bar car or on a plane or potentially you know in a in a foreign land. So to to you, especially compared to the two eras that you previously covered, what are some of the trends that really set the mid-century apart when it comes to drinking at home and then drinking outside of the home? At home, there was, of course, the cocktail party, often a suburban event or perhaps drinking in the city at a club after hours after the theater. Uh, the 21 Club, the Stork Club. Uh, in the suburbs, there was dress-up drinking among the middle and upper middle class. A cocktail dress, high heels. The men are wearing coats and ties. Uh, perhaps it's a blazer, but it is a tie and a, and a colored shirt. Um, and And... It's a sense of deliberate sophistication. And at the restaurant, uh, also, people dressed up. Uh, now, another, another kind of drinking out, let's, let's acknowledge, uh, was the fantasy of being far away, perhaps in the Pacific, in the tiki culture, uh, the South Pacific, and that for Americans seemed to include Hawaii in the North Pacific, uh, as well as all the islands. So we had originally uh, in Southern California uh, a man who dubbed himself Don Beach uh, and opened a restaurant called Don the Beachcombers. And this idea of fantasy drinking, in which you came to something like a thatched hut with bamboo, tiki gods, perhaps the sound of soft rain pattering on the roof, uh, perhaps the sound of exotic birds, and you were transported for a while, drinking from a from a calabash or, or a tiki god mug, first from Don the Beachcomber and then from Trader Vic's, Victor Bergeron, who from Northern California, Oakland, after a successful stint with his, with his bar, Tinky Dinks, he studied rum and he really studied it. And his rum drinks were the foundation for Trader Vicks, soon to be found in hotel chains in cities all over the country. Uh, and so you entered Trader Vicks and you were transported. You were drinking outside your home. You weren't in the suburbs. You weren't in your bachelor pad. Uh, you were in the South Sea Islands, uh, maybe drinking a Mai Tai. Uh, and I would say that rum came into fashion in this era uh, in a way it never had been. There was always rum, demon rum, grog. Uh, but now there were rums, not just light and dark, but branded rums. And Victor Bergeron really did study his rums uh, and deployed them in, in all of those restaurants in the different, in the different drinks. Um, there even was, I was trying to find it, which of the commuter cars, was it the New York Central, was it the Long Island? One of them outfitted the bar car uh, as, a, as a tiki bar with bamboo and thatching and tried, tried to get the commuter to transport for a brief, brief span between the <laughs> office and the home where the kids had the measles or the washing machine had overflowed. Uh, but that's another way. So drinking, drinking in the home, was a sophisticated event. People were nicely dressed and nicely behaved. Um, but the recommendation for how much of half a case of rye, 
perhaps half a case of bourbon, surely a whole case of gin. Um, uh, that was a measure of how much really was, was, was being consumed. Everybody mm -hmm. looking good in the home. And this is a period, too, of, of um, living spaces, living rooms that accommodated such parties on the weekends especially, depending on your, your social stratus. Um, uh, but if you were in the ex exurbs, you had, you had ample room. Maybe you had no furniture, fine design, uh, Noguchi uh, tables and chairs. Your furniture and your beverages were a good correlate for one another. That's a really interesting point because as you were pulling out some of these details, one of the things that strikes me as a very stark difference between this era that you're describing and the Gilded Age, for example, is you know our almost our central or final thesis during that conversation was like, wow. We're almost like experiencing a new Gilded Age right now because of how much technology is blowing up. But in the Gilded Age, technology was only for the elite or the, the emerging technologies were only utilized at their peak potential by people with a lot of money. And what it seems like is that during the mid-century, the mid-20th century, technology had become more affordable and it was almost this antidote to squalor. Uh, I, I remember at one point in your book, you talk about the scourge of polio and Jonas Salk and, and his and his miracle cure, and how this tech, this this emergent medical technology, which was very rapidly made available to pretty much anybody who wanted it, suddenly eliminated a huge amount of fear and anxiety about this invisible disease that could strike any child at any moment. Eric, isn't that, isn't that, that's a, such an interesting and, and useful point because we've been talking about the fears uh, and summertime was a time of, of fear before Salk and Sabin uh, came along and, and it was just suddenly wiped out this terror of the iron lung. I can remember it's third grade and the teacher announcing that Luann would not be with us any longer. Uh, she had been diagnosed with poliomyelitis uh, and, and off, off she went. And swimming pools, it was a huge issue. Could I go to the swimming pool? Because it was thought that polio just, just festered in that swimming pool cool water. And then came Jonas Salk and he, he refused to profit from that discovery. It was for the public good, and mm. it was a gift to the public. And ever since, yes. So the alleviation of some fears was, was a crucial dimension of the prosperity of, the, of this era. I think also interesting to note poliomyelitis, myelitis referring to myelin, myelin referring to the sheath around the nervous system, a disease of the nerves, the cooling of the pool, a calming type thing. Everything seems to be coming back to anxiety here. This book, more than perhaps any of the rest of your books, puts me in touch, certainly you, because you have these memories. You have the literal memory of being told about Luann and the Iron Lung. But for me- but that's not in the book. It's not in the book. Okay. But to, so wonderful, wonderful little uh, behind behind the scenes here on the Modern Bar Cart podcast. But I, I mean, I'm I I don't feel all that far from it either. My grandfather was the recipient of you know help from the GI Bill, and uh, he was able to take that money and buy you know a, a a pretty nice piece of land and build a house on it. And he had three daughters, each of them you know, was offered a piece of that land. And so I, I, I grew up in, I, I, I grew up as a fairly direct beneficiary of the, G, the GI bill. And, uh, just finally this year, like the last piece of that is being kind of sold off. And it's, um, I, it's very, very, uh, very visceral to me, even here in 2022, uh, of, of sort of 
just now realizing that privilege that I had that was a direct consequence of this very specific era in time. And, you know, you're, you're referencing these images of the bombed out cities. That's, that's how my grandfather, uh, a French Canadian immigrant got that GI bill was he went over to France cause he could speak the language and, and helped rebuild cities in that immediate post-war timeframe. So even it, if someone's listening to this and wondering like, all right, besides getting my tiki fix and learning what Don Draper was really up to and, you know, maybe reading some fun stuff about Jack Kerouac, et cetera, et cetera. What's the point of like, is there any intellectual nutrition from this book? And I would say maybe in addition to intellectual nutrition, getting some facts, it's the ability to place oneself in context with a history that is more eerie when we see the echoes of it repeating today and the same issues that we we continue to face. Um, so I, I think that might be a good segue to talking about the Green Book and what folks who were not living in the Levittowns, in the white suburbs and the even whiter exurbs were struggling with and also finding ways to alleviate with drink and with uh, actually the the opportunity for once, perhaps for the first time, to travel. For the first time to travel. Good point. The automobile. Uh, uh, Victor Green's Green Book. And of course, the movie uh, in just the last few years, and it won, I think, an Oscar and was controversial uh, because it focused on the on the white guy who was driving uh, the limousine uh, more than it did on the on the African American uh, culture and milieu uh, that that he was driving into. You know, Toni Morrison's I think last novel, Home, uh, is useful in this regard. Uh, after it's the Korean War, and we haven't murmured about that, but but a veteran comes home and and finds the same segregation. Morrison did not take up the Green Book, but here was the Green Book all over African-American culture. There had been guides for travel since the 1910s when the AAA started to publish a book for motorists. And by the end of, let's remember, by the end of World War I, there was something like 6.7 million automobiles on the road and only to grow larger in numbers. And came, came Chevy Dinosaur, the Dinosaur Chevy Show. See the USA in your Chevrolet. Well, Victor Green said, well, maybe a Chevrolet, maybe a Ford. Uh, in his, I think it's his 1947 edition, and he was doing very well, earning his living as a postal uh, worker, uh, but, and, and of course, jobs open to African Americans because it was a civil service test that qualified you, not the color of your skin. So he was a postal worker, but also on the side, developing this travel uh, travel business. And he talked about the cars. Uh, if, you, if you needed basic transportation, Chevy or Ford was a good bet. Uh, if you could step it up, here's the Oldsmobile. Here's the Buick. Uh, and if you really could step it up, there's the Lincoln and there's the Cadillac. Uh, and he talked about those cars lovingly and accurately. Uh, and beckoned his fans, Green Book fans, to take to the road and told them where they could go for services, for fuel, for food, for restaurant dining, and for services such as hairstylists, dry cleaners. Uh, and so advertisers began to to buy space in the Green Book, edition after edition. Victor Green cautioned all of his readers to beware of those places where 
the so-called, as he said, Jim Crow laws pertain. And he talked, of course, about the Deep South. But in those states, including Louisiana, there were the nightclubs where the best jazz music could be heard. Mm-hmm. Let me remind everybody that, yes, this era, mid-century, was the big rock and roll era. Here's Elvis. Here's Chubby Checker, Fats Domino, and so on and so on. These, however, at the time were the kids below the drinking age. Not that they didn't, you know, swizzle uh, when they could, but, but the rock and roll culture was for adolescence, uh, and Elvis Presley, a teetotaler, drank Coca-Cola. So these jazz artists, instrumentalists, vocalists, they were performing in the black nightclubs uh, in the major cities. They do drop in. Sometimes a club would be called Harlem, echoing Harlem of the Jazz Age 1920s. Or it would be called the Congo Room, with an echo of of the African lineage. Uh, But there might be the best jazz music. You also could hear in the Playboy Club, Hugh Hefner, booking these same artists. So the artist might be at the Do Drop In one week and at a Playboy Club the next. Who were the clientele? The Blacks who were welcome for whom these clubs existed, but whites from the suburbs might join in um, because they wanted to hear that music. They wanted to be a part of of an ambiance that was not available in the burbs. Uh, And sometimes this era is dismissed as dull. Not, Not at all. Uh, it's an era, yes, fraught with anxiety. You hear the anxiety in the trumpet <laughs> of the wailing saxophone. At the same time, uh, the spark of life in, in, the, in the flame room in Detroit, where gross point suburbanites drove in to hear, maybe to hear Etta James singing that night and, and sit alongside with those of another complexion. So Victor Green's Green Book, as far as I know, was not being absorbed, read by whites. But the word that the suburban whites passed among themselves is, if you like jazz, if you really like to hear some good jazz, you've got to go into the city. You've got to go to the flame. Uh, There you're going to hear something. And you're going to have good drinks, too. Now, Victor Green... While we're still on this topic, um, it's important to note that his last Green Book was published in 1962. Now, by this time, he was no longer wrong. He had, in fact, he was deceased by this time. But he gave up his postal work uh, along the way. Was making his living with the edition, subsequent editions of the Green Book. He was a travel agent for air travel. He was recommending that his patrons book uh, flights to the Caribbean, to Europe, go. Uh, By 1962, the Green Book, its last edition, and there were essays on the civil rights movement that the Southern uh, Negro conferences, that 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 the civil rights movement was making such headway that it had to put the Green Book out of business and RIP. So there was a a celebration of what black America was now up to and up for uh, and no more need for the Green Book. We know that the story continues on to be much more complicated even today. Uh, But but that Green Book was a a lifeline for an income earning Black America that wanted the same, the same benefits as the whites on the other side of the color line. And Victor Green 
was able to supply that lifeline, that guide. Hmm. It also strikes me not just as a piece of information or a, a publication, you might say, but also as a bit of a technology that still remains somewhat relevant to this day. It's, it, was, it was a directory. We all grew up with the yellow pages and the white pages, which were directories, but this was a directory that had perhaps a more vital function in that it was the difference between you getting a hot meal and a good drink or finding the club where the best jazz was and you getting your life threatened or potentially taken away from you if you make the wrong choice in the Jim Crow South. If you pick the wrong plumber from the yellow pages, maybe you know you have to call another plumber to come fix their work. Again, it's it strikes me a little bit as an exercise in in scale at this time whereas you know looking back gilded age only a handful of people were doing these incredible things with drinks whereas now as we've scaled certain things certain technologies more people there's more bodies in the mix there's more money in the mix there's higher stakes in certain respects and so to me I really do think of the Green Book as kind of a technology, and certainly it was leveraged as a technology, perhaps a cultural technology, but a technology nonetheless. And I do also, you know, I've probably said it already, and I, I may say it again, but we, we definitely need to do an entire episode on the Green Book. Uh, there, I've, I've actually listened to other episodes of other podcasts dedicated to this publication, and I think it, it bears certainly looking into from a cocktail standpoint, because I believe it was Tom Bullock, yep. the famous African-American bartender that was referenced in this book. Is that correct? Absolutely. I think his book was published uh, in, in uh, 1917, full of the juleps that, mm. that he had devised uh, in the clubs where he had tended bar and mixed his special drinks. Uh, and by the time the Green Book was, was published, the bartenders in the, in the uh, oases that Victor Green recommended could mix any drink and did. You want a martini? Great. Got it. You want uh, scotch and soda? Of course, that's easy. Uh, what do you want? I've got it for you. But but Bullock's drinks also were there as a tribute to the black bartender who was, in, in his way, the counterpart to the patriarchal Jerry Thomas, uh, founder of, of the, the modern bar, so to speak. Yes. Yeah, and I believe he may even have a DC connection. So I, I think mm. Tom Bullock is is long overdue for uh, for a little bit of uh, specific coverage here on the Modern Bar Cart podcast. But your book contains chapters on many more aspects of mid century drinking than we've been able to cover here in our short time together. We have. I, I, I just want to kind of throw a few out there and maybe have you clean up some of the other topics so that folks can just get a little taste of some of the other niches that you delve into. So one of them for me uh, that I recall is there's uh, there's the islands in the stream where you're talking about sort of the, the uh, influence of some of these islands just off the Gulf Coast. Obviously, we've got Cuba, we've got Puerto Rico, uh, there's bachelor pads. Uh, we've made reference uh, a few times to the, the Playboy aspects of drinking that kind of cropped up. But what are some of the other chapters or categories that we haven't yet covered that we can tease our listeners with so that if they go and pick up a copy of your book when it comes out, that they can dive into? Well, here's one, for example, the Barbizon Hotel for Women uh, in New York City. Uh, you remember, we remember the unsinkable Marley Brown uh, Molly Brown had lived in this hotel for women, but came the 50s. And the Barbizon was the go-to place for aspiring young women who wanted careers. So Grace Kelly, Joan Didion, um, Tippi Hedren, um, I could go on. Just to say, 
what sparked the Barbizon particularly was the Mademoiselle Magazine College Contest in which young women all over the country uh, vied for a June month at the Barbizon interning for Mademoiselle Magazine. And when they did, the watering holes, especially Malachy's Bar, right a few blocks away, were theirs. It is, um, it is the place where Sylvia Plath's novel, The Bell Jar, is featured. Uh, and so that novel for Plath, readers, Plath fans, um, sort of recaptures the Barbizon Hotel. So that was a real hot spot. Uh, another, I think, uh, to ask who are some of the, the interesting figures, Mary Wells of the, of the Wells Rich Green Advertising Agency that in its time got the Braniff airline account and painted the commercial airliners all these brilliant colors and had Emilio Pucci design, design the, the stews, the flight attendants, cocktail dresses, the end of the plane, plane, P-L-A-I-N, plane, was the, was the, uh, the slogan. And Mary, Mary Wells would boast that in this jet flight age, she could spend the morning in Honolulu uh, looking for some space, possibly to open a new, a new branch office, the afternoon somewhere else, and by evening she's in Detroit chasing down the Ford corporate account. Uh, and so we have these, these, these characters, and who, <laughs> with Mary Wells said, she wasn't much of a drinker, but she realized she had to hold her own, and she worked on martinis till she could do that and smoke a cigarette at the same time. Uh, so, so the book, I think, is, is uh, kind of replete with, with who, was, who, was the, who were the bold-faced names. Let me mention a couple of others because the the flight attendants remember beautiful Elizabeth Taylor in their planes and how sweet and kind she was. In one case, bringing her own lunch with Richard Burton, her lover, soon to be husband, because she feared she was a little late and all the food might be might be claimed already spoken for. And she brought her own lunch and autographed pictures. Uh, and was just the nicest person on the plane. So this whole celebrity, uh, this was before celebrities uh, chartered private planes. So there they were in first class uh, and, and the reports on their conduct. And I have to say, take a lesson. They were really nice, even Richard Nixon. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so, the, so the book is, is kind of, I think, pops uh, with bold-faced names that are still memorable today. Yes, yes, it is. I mean, as was Gilded Age cocktails, but Gilded Age cocktails because it is several decades, if not you know, almost a century earlier. Those names have faded into myth and portraiture, whereas we still have film of a lot of the folks in the mid-century cocktails book. So I, I definitely, from from that perspective. From, from the perspective of getting these very specific insights into the lives of people, both great and small, living in this era, I, I, I highly recommend the book. But Cecilia, I, I wanted to wrap up this interview by referencing some of the things that, some of the larger issues or themes, I suppose, that, that we've already mentioned. And I... I actually drew down when when you when you said this phrase you you mentioned you know living in a duplex of bounty and fear and I literally drew a little duplex on my notes and I I, I can't I can't help but imagine that as as a as a perfect metaphor to describe what propelled people in this time because if you're living on the side of the duplex of bounty you can still hear fear through the wall, the and if you're living on the side on, on the side of fear, bounty is also right on the other side of the wall. 
And uh, so I can, I can see this almost cyclical or dual or gyrating impulse in that single image that you've painted. And I, I wonder coming out of this project and living in this world that we all currently live in today with COVID instead of polio, et cetera, et cetera. If you feel that knowing what we've gone through in the mid-century, you have a sense of optimism for what we're facing today, or if it seems a little bit too close in quality and fidelity to what was actually going on at that time, that it, that it maybe concerns you. I don't know if that's a, a too big of a question, but you can feel free to take it or redirect it however you choose. Well, uh, the, the cocktail culture, the craft cocktail culture of these years is going to be written about. Um, I think uh, some will take a stab at it sooner than later, but but it hasn't begun to gel into the, the, the forms that will lend itself to, to the kind of cocktail book that's possible from this 50s retrospect, 50s, early mm -hmm. 60s. What might we might what 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 might we take away? And what might we choose to pluck out from this period? Um, certainly, we know what we would not want to sustain. But let's remember, because you've remember, you've reminded us, your grandfather was able, as a vet, to get property. So many veterans on the GI Bill went to school and did well in their civilian lives. Uh, there's an economist who recently said, you know, these days, I'm talking about the, the, the 2022s, uh, people have a flat screen TV, people have their devices, phones, screens. But what people need that was possible for many more people in mid-century is affordable education, affordable transportation, affordable health care. These are big ones. And they're out of bounds, out of reach for way too many of us today. Jane Fonda has just announced, you've heard this, her treatment for recurrent cancer. But she added that she has the very best health care that is unavailable for far too many people. So I think what we might pluck out of this, this mid-century from the bountifulness is the availability for brighter futures by way of affordability. Something has gone awry in wealth inequality, and that goes back to the Gilded Age as well. Big big time of slums and poverty. And Jack London wrote about it out the wazoo, trying to fix it. By mid-century, a lot of that was fixed. Um, vets came back and went to school and started businesses and flourished. We need more of that today, affordability. And I think, you know, going back to the Gilded Age book, I think we all, at the end of the day, want to be drinking like an aster. We don't necessarily want to be, you know, Joe Sixpack necessarily. Joe Sixpack is not aspirational, although he may be content, which is in itself another potential lesson to draw. But if the aspiration is to to drink like an aster and really delight in premium ingredients and having just a, a few delightful mind expanding libations as opposed to the three martini lunch followed by the three martini pre-dinner followed by the two bottle of wine dinner followed by the you know three whatever after dinner uh i i think those those are those stand in, in fairly stark contrast and so i think from from the standpoint of uh of how those larger trends maybe trickle down 
and influence our own habits, um, you know, we can maybe start attacking that issue from, from, from both ends. So hopefully, uh, those of you listening will be inspired, curious enough by some of the trends and some of the personalities that we've discussed here today to pick up your copy of Gilded Age cocktail or, oh, sorry, mid-century cocktails. We've already got our copies of the Gilded Age book. This is a, a galley proof of, it's going to be a silver cover. Um, Mm -hmm. this is the, this is just the, the proof, but this is what, you know, the mock-up. Uh, and the book will have the same high quality of production as Gilded Age and Jazz Age. Amazing. And can you just remind us of the, because we're recording this a few weeks in advance here, mm-hmm. can you re- remind us of the tentative launch date and the publisher? The official launch date is November 1, uh, hoping for a holiday you know, sale. The books it's going, it are going to be shipped in October next month. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we will, of course, have links to everything over on the show notes page at modernbarcart.com forward slash podcast. Cecilia, I'm going to drop one potentially delightful little factoid that you may not have come across. But uh, a couple of weeks ago, I, I just came across an article saying that the brand uh, Don the Beachcombers was recently purchased by a group in Tampa, Florida. So uh, we may see very soon a revival of this mid-century chain. So I figured as we sign off here, I would thank you for, uh, as always, your your lovely elocution and uh, description of the historical trends and time periods that we were discussing and also leave that as a little tidbit that we might look forward to. See you there. Thank you, Eric. All right. Cecilia Tishy, thank you for being a guest here on the Modern Bar Cart Podcast. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here. And by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. You can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice, or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear. Also, definitely follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Modern Bar Cart for cocktail porn, recipes, and entertaining tips. And keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode was made possible with editing and sound design by Samantha Reed, mid-century cocktail insights courtesy of Cecilia Tishy, and a little bit of interview magic by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2022.